ሲኤሲ ፈትሊት ኦዋ ኮመል ፕሮግራም አይ ሹድ ቴክ ዶስ ታይም ቱ ኢንትሮዱስ ማይ ሴልፍ በጣም ትፊቲ ለማግኘት ፍሮም ዘ አይፒኤስ ሴንተር and community engagement coordinator about the center and also the lecture and uh, i'm very thankful to the science center for inviting us to render a presentation for the day for the national science week with the theme celebrating the role of basic sciences in modern world and i think uh, my presentation is at par with the theme of the of the year because we are going to be looking at indigenous mining and its implication for socio economic development of rural communities in south africa uh, i'm going to be looking at about five points the first one being just the introduction the second one giving the background to the ik act and how it gives effect to the issue of indigenous mining i'm going to be looking at indigenous mining as sdgs and then a bit of background and understanding into the indigenous mining lastly i'll be focusing into the site that we have identified to start with the indigenous mining project uh, together with the department of science and innovation as we are all aware south africa has got a rich history of mining and it is dated back to some 2000 years ago and this is because our own indigenous people here in south africa from their various ethnic communities have been practicing this kind of um, science to make sure that they can meet the demands of their day-to-day -day lives. Um, we can also look into the issue of the discovery of the, of the diamond in Kimberley, and this has received quite a lot of attention, and I know some of the movies were produced into this um, aspect of the diamond that was discovered in Kimberley. And also, we know that um, Cecil John Rhodes was promoting his empire through mining um, after they have made sure that they commercialized the gold, re uh, gold revenues in the Transvaal. And also, this now provoked what we call the uh, British provoking the South African War th that took place between 1899 and 1902. Uh, from the discovery of the diamonds in Kimberley, other minerals were then discovered by various um, stakeholders, uh, minerals such as coal, manganese, iron, iron ore, and platinum. Those were now becoming uh, another industrial revolution in South Africa, and they zoomed in into mining deeply. Uh, mining then in turn stimulated a lot of agriculture and a lot of manufacturing and services which led to the expansions of various towns that we have today in South Africa. Now, from where we are sitting as the IKS Center, we have been working with uh, the Department of Science and Innovation within the, what we call the National Indigenous Knowledge Systems Office there, the DSI, and we were working towards the development of the IK bill. Now, the bill then got signed to law by the president in 2019, the 23rd of August, 2019. So we are actually in the month where President Cyril Ramaphosa signed the, the bill into law and it became the IK Act that we know as the IK Act number six of 2019. Now the act is focused on four issues. The first one being the protection, second one promotion, uh, third being the development, and the last one being the management of indigenous knowledge. This is because we saw that there's a lot of this indigenous knowledge that has been uh, stolen, if I can use the term, biopirated, and it has been benefiting other people as compared to the indigenous communities. Now, when this act was signed, we then identified 18 disciplines, and then indigenous mining is one of those, it makes up um, one entity of those disciplines. And this is now an area that we feel is not tapped into, and because we are a huge mining uh, country, we have now to dwell into this issue and start making sure that we are beneficiating our own people through their indigenous knowledge. Uh, indigenous mining now, you know, the mining industry as a whole has the potential to achieve quite a number of things. And I think it is very well at par with 
the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. And firstly, we can look at um, the minerals being necessary to achieve technological progression. Because if we do not have these minerals, then we are going to reach a stage where we say we are stagnant. And stagnation is not very good for any community. And then now secondly, we are saying that most of these mines, they are situated in what we say geographically isolated areas or the rural communities and towns. But if you look into those towns or those communities, there's no method of beneficiation that's going to them. They still remain poor, they still remain without services, yet they are hosting multi-million and multi-billion mines within their communities. And I think again, we, we zoomed into this issue of indigenous mining because there's been a lot of noise around the people that we call Zamazamas. And Zamazamas are the people who go illegally into the mining sites to try and uh, access the, the minerals for themselves. Now, other people, they are not Zamazamas. Uh, for an example, they're in Pitretif. We have a lot of people who have quite extensive indigenous knowledge about identifying sites of mining. I think that aspect, I'm gonna touch on it a bit later on during the presentation. Uh, now, the idea of mining has been perpetuated to be a Western thing. Uh, we have been taught that you know, without the West, without the British, we could not have had uh, mining or the knowledge about mining. Not knowing that coming here 200 years ago, 2,000 years ago was not the discovery of mine itself, but the mining was already in existence here in Africa as a whole, not specifically South Africa, because when we say South Africa, we'll be talking about the colonial borders that we have inherited. So mining has been vastly practiced by various ethnic communities, like I indicated, you know, Vavenda, they, they've got quite extensive knowledge about mining. The Amazulu, they've got quite extensive knowledge about uh, metallurgy. And metallurgy is one form of indigenous mining. You know, even the Batswanas, the Khoi and the Sen communities have been practicing indigenous mining for a lot of time or for a long time. So there has previously been quite a number of these indigenous mines, which were now after the mining industry was regulated they ended up being closed down because it was deemed as illegal mining. Um, however, you look into these um, conventional mining surveyors, you know, they, they go to communities and they still talk to our elders, they still talk to the indigenous people to, to show them the areas or the sites which are rich in minerals. Yet in turn, those elders are not acknowledged and bear in mind that these elders are doing these discoveries without using any form of what we call scientific tools or apparatuses. So, you know, gold has been mined in Ghana, gold has been mined in Egypt. The Egyptians always had a lot of jewelry, way before we could say that the British came and then did all this. So this shows that indigenous communities or indigenous people have got quite extensive knowledge in terms of mining or the mining sector. And it's a pity that when we are hosting this mining in Dabas and mining in Bezos, we never involve such people. We leave them in the margins. We are continuing to marginalize our own people who have got so much knowledge that they can actually start uh, contributing into the socioeconomic development of their rural communities. Uh, we've got three uh, basic mining strategies. Uh, we, we call them the pre-colonial, but I actually do not like that term. Um, however, the, the three, the first one would be the alluvial gold mining. Uh, this is the mining that took place in, in the river banks. And we had quite a number of people who were doing that on a day-to-day -day basis. Then we have the surface or shallow pit mining. And this is where people dug smaller and smaller portions of, of these holes where now they can start accessing the minerals. And then the last one would be the deep pit mining. And the deep pit mining, they were using kind of a bucket system to transport these uh, resources or minerals from underneath the ground to the surface. Then from there on, that's when we started discovering that there's uh, copper that can be mined, there's the tin, and then there's the iron that are mined by the indigenous communities. Uh, we were saying that the, the, the Amazulu were practicing metallurgy because if you look into 
the spears that were developed by Amazulu and some of the Botswanas. They, they were developed by the communities themselves. They never um, made a bid for a tender for someone to come and provide that to them. So this shows that the, uh, our people have had this knowledge for the longest time. They knew how to take certain stones. Uh, we've got iron ore stones that they would burn and then they would hammer down to make their weapons. And till today, we are still not giving credit to these people. Hence why the IK Act is now in, in full swing. We are busy with the regulation and we are trying to regulate this. So those 18 disciplines, we are busy with, <coughs> with their regulations. And then um, I'm happy that Dr. Muteo was, is in the presence of, of, of this presentation because one of the other issues where we said that our people have got a vast knowledge but they are not acknowledged. So we thought that it's about time that we started recognizing these people. So we've got another project spearheaded by Dr. Muteo and Ms. Kota Zomafiri, where the, the RPL recognition of prior learning, where they are starting to acknowledge the vast knowledge of, of our people. And they are using a system that we call a peer-to-peer -peer, um, assessment, where we as the university or we as the people who think are educated are not sitting in that panel. We just oversee those. So the issue of indigenous mining, because we saw how vital it is for us, we, we then um, identified one province and one community within that province, which is the Pitretif in Pumalang. And Pitretif, we identified it because it has got a long history of mining as a community. And um, we, we went there sometime last year to meet with the community, and we even called uh, the mining people to come and join us into that two-day workshop. And when we went there, before we presented, we, we had the surveyors telling us how they go about identifying sites for mining. And um, one of those surveyors said that he goes into the community and he asks who is the elder who has that knowledge to show them the site. And we know that our people, we are hungry, we, we, we are unemployed, and we need every little bit of money that we can get. The elder would take those people to the site where it's rich with um, minerals, whatever kind of mineral that may be in that site. And the surveyors, after doing that, they'll just buy them a bottle of whiskey or a, a quart of black label. Then take the knowledge, two months down the line, we see a huge plantation of the mine and uh, no beneficiation of what, whatever kind to the community. Now, we, we then thought that we need to develop a tool that we can now start to utilize to give to effect the, the Indigenous Knowledge Act that I was talking about earlier on. So we have what we call the Biocultural Community Protocol, and this BCP, in short, um, we are going around making uh, public awarenesses together with the Department of Science and Innovation. And uh, this is the tool, we, our vision with this, the Northwest University's vision together with the GSI, is to make sure that each and every community would develop this BCP. The BCP now is a document that is going to set out the clear terms and conditions of the community. And this will be communicated to all the third parties who would want to do business with the communities. Like I said previously, there's no beneficiation to these communities. We still remain poor, we still remain unemployed. You know, even the big mining companies, where they come, they don't even employ the local people. They bring their own uh, uh, workforce into the communities. So this BCP now, we said that now, if we, we gazette it with, 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 with government, then all the companies, all the third parties, all the entities will be forced now to go back into the communities and say, how can we beneficiate you as a collective? And you know, we, we made sure that this is a participatory decision-making process because when we talk about indigenous knowledge systems, we say it, the decisions are, are collectively taken no one or no singular individual takes the decisions for the communities. And we, we saw it, uh, a lot of people were contesting the PCPs. And those who have uh, engaged with me in this public awareness have seen, sometimes the, 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 the workshops, they become so hostile that we have to leave running. This is because people think that we are going now to take the communities and put them in front of them. And we, with that not being done, um, they, they will forever biopirate, they will forever misappropriate the knowledge, and then they will forever take all these resources from the communities. So the BCP, we take it as a, 
as a tool that gives an extra set of rights to the communities. So far, we have done BCPs in 200 communities across South Africa, and we are still continuing. We, the target is 800. The target is 800, and that is the promise. As the Northwest University, we made that promise to the president that we are going to cover 800 communities, and all those communities are geographically isolated. So it's, it's quite an extensive and difficult um, exercise to do, and we've been running with it for the past four years. So for four years, 200 communities, that means we still have, what, another eight years to cover the remaining 400. So e PCP, like I said, we do not disrupt or disrupt the way of life of the people. So if the mining, the conventional mining uh, companies want to go into the communities and start mining there, they will have to sit down with the communities and negotiate uh, the terms of engagement and also take into cognizance the indigenous knowledge and indigenous miners of those communities. Now, I did mention that we, we have identified one site, and that is Pitretif in Pumalanga. And um, the far right picture, my right, my far right picture, uh, that's myself with the two officials from the DSI. We had, um, after doing the, the workshops there in Pitretif, we site visited uh, a mine called Jindal Mine. And Jindal Mine is, is largely owned by the Indian community and not the Indian community here in South Africa, but from outside. So they're taking all these resources and they're sending them to, to um, the other shores and they're sending, selling them and making a lot of money when our own people there in Petritif are still unemployed. When we did our own research and looked at the unemployment rate there, and the people who've got metric and other people have even have tertiary qualifications, but yet they're not um, employed in those mines. We, we also took to the side uh, two students, and that other student there is actually a fourth year student, a viewer Matsozo, who was um, focusing on this issue of indigenous mining. And she is one of the people that we want to continue working with because, you know, this is a market that is still untapped on. This is a market that a lot of people run away from, and because it has got a lot of, um, you know, politics, let me put it that way, it has got a lot of politics, and people are trying to run away from that. So we, the legal office from, from the Department of Science and Innovation, um, and also the Department of Mineral and Energy Resources have been talking about this issue, and we are trying to see how we can enforce uh, this IK Act into these mining communities. And Peter Diff is just, um, is a pilot. We are piloting with Peter Diff and then we are going to venture out to all the other provinces, uh, to all the other, com especially the indigenous rural communities who have these mines. And we make sure that this science, this indigenous mining science is well recognized and it is taken into uh, uh, um, consideration because we believe that it can drive the socioeconomic development of these rural communities. So if we make the resources that are existing within the communities to work actually for the communities, then our goal would be achieved as the IK Center and also as the TSI. Now, um, with the IK Act and Indigenous Mining, we, we are trying to develop a panel, a panel of experts, and um, unfortunately, we are not the experts. We, we are the academic experts and we, we cannot sit in the clique of indigenous mining experts. We just try to advise them because of the, 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 the legal matters or the, yeah, the, the legislative issues. And the main or focal point of this indigenous mining, like I indicated, we are focusing on beneficiation. And beneficiation is quite a big issue because when resources are not beneficiating the people who are actually occupying the land that has all these resources. It becomes an extensive problem for us. So we, we, we consulted quite a number of, of um, legal documents and we have been engaging with various stakeholders, not only here in South Africa. But I think it's important to, to raise or to note that we as South Africa are signatory to quite a number of treaties in the world. Um, the CBD being one, of those, um, the, Con is the Convention on Biological Diversity. We also signed the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And then we have our own um, 
legislation that we looked into in order for us to develop the IK Act and the Biocultural Community Protocol. And that is the NEMBA Act, uh, or NEMBA. We looked at the Intellectual Property Act. We looked at, um, what is this other one? There's another one that I'm forgetting. I just forgot it right now. And we, we are tapping into those because the focal point is beneficiation. And if we can make sure that our communities are actually benefiting from their own knowledge systems, then we would be doing quite a good job. We, we have been across all the nine provinces like indicated, and the IK Act um, has an avenue where we are allowing for the cross-border or international treaties to come into play where now benefit sharing goes uh, across the board. And we are looking into working with all the SADC, um, SADC uh, countries or the countries that are within the SADC region and make sure that the Act works for them. The Act has been so extensive that we have had people from other countries coming here to benchmark with us in terms of how we are going to protect this indigenous knowledge, how are we going to promote it, how are we going to manage it. Hence why I mentioned that we have that office that it is already established now. When the president signed the Act into law, we, we did not have the office fully functional. But right now, the National Indigenous Knowledge Systems Office is fully functional, and we are making sure that we appoint relevant people in those in those offices and um, we have three entities within the, the Nixo office and the first one is knowledge management because before any other physical activity can take place we start first with the knowledge the knowledge associated with indigenous mining so we are looking at the intellectual uh, capabilities of our people and making sure that that knowledge is managed well and it's protected because if we do not protect such valuable information or knowledge, it's going to continue being pirated, it's going to continue being stolen by a lot of people, and then we'll still remain unemployed, jobless, and really without any kind of future that we can depend on. And we even encourage um, our indigenous knowledge holders to register their, their knowledge with, with the National Indigenous Knowledge Systems Office. Because if we know that in Petritif there are people who have vast knowledge about indigenous mining, but we do not register that knowledge, then anyone can actually go to the community and infiltrate it, steal the knowledge, and then utilize it somewhere else. So if the knowledge is registered, uh, we've got a system, a very uh, highly protected system that we call NIGMAS. And NIGMAS, we make sure that no one can access that system apart from the people from DSI in conjunction with the Northwest University. And we are the first university, not only in South Africa, but in Africa as a whole, to have this kind of a program and to also be spearheading indigenous knowledge systems in the manner that we are doing. And we are making strides across the globe where everyone now is starting to talk about this indigenous knowledge and how it can be utilized to drive sustainable development in communities. Now, I'm, I'm a man of very few words. I'm very soft-spoken, and I think it's about time that I conclude. And I'm saying that there is a need for vast research to be done on issues of indigenous mining. The small research that has been done was done in mainly the Bafokeng area and then the Bakhatla. And the, the, the focus was not really on indigenous mining, it was on the conventional mining that we know. And they never even tapped on issues of benefit sharing. So we want more people to go into this, um, this entity or this stream of indigenous knowledge to go and then do more research on this. We had one student, um, he's now, he's a, he's a colleague now from University of Mpumalang, uh, Mr. Ndlovu, who actually did research um, here at Northwest University on metallurgy. So metallurgy, as I said, is one entity of indigenous mining, and his study caused quite a stir, and we saw a lot of people welcoming that kind of work and trying to venture on with it. And we, we, we have the people, we've got the know-how, you know. Uh, last week when I was in Rustenburg, I was with, with I had the, 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 the opportunity to sit with Dr. Dima from, from Venda, and he had shared vast knowledge about this indigenous mining and I ended up saying, you know what, Doc, uh, maybe you are doing a mistake by sharing this with me because I might steal the knowledge myself and tomorrow I'll be a billionaire here in South Africa. 
So it's, that's why we even encourage, like I said, we encourage that our people should register this knowledge. Um, so we, we are attracting quite a number of, of researchers to come and go into this disciplinary, um, I, I mean this discipline. So we say indigenous knowledge research is inter, multi, and transdisciplinary, which means that we, we do not work in silos. We work with other people. Um, because we even had the question where they said, is indigenous knowledge a science? And it caused also quite a number of states where people were like, nah, it's not a science. But if you look at it, it's quite an extensive science and it's the first science practiced by the indigenous people. And there have been quite a lot of efforts to uh, achieve this holistic picture of indigenous mining and make sure that we shine the light on it. And I think with the assistance of the Science Center now hosting this webinar for us and making sure that people are able to learn about this indigenous mining and see it for what it is and how it can benefit our people, I think we are a step closer to achieving the milestone that we want to achieve as the IK Center, as the Northwest University, and also as the Department of Science and Innovation. And with that, I thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I do not know, Auslerato, uh, do we have the question and answer sessions? Okay. Okay, yeah, this is the time for questions, so you are allowed to ask questions to the presenter. Thank you. Yeah, I see there's, there's a hand here from my colleague. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, future Dr. O, uh, for the presentation, in, very informative. Uh, <clears throat> I just uh, was uh, thinking, Jay, with the, uh, what you, 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 we talk beneficiation uh, with the, co uh, the community should benefit from uh, our, their knowledge. Now, when we talk mining now, we talk issues of land, uh, I, I, I'm just, uh, I want to know, Hore, how, how does the act and uh, the work that you've been doing now uh, is in the four years talk to ownership because we cannot only wait for someone to come and uh, expropriate uh, knowledge or resources from our land while we are sitting and I'm just I just want to know her like uh, are there programs like encouraging communities to start their own thing uh, like, like for instance you, you say uh, you the, the community in Petritif uh, they have vast knowledge in mining so I just want to know, Hore, uh, what are our uh, steps here, maybe as IKS Center and uh, the DSI, in terms of encouraging ownership and uh, the community starting their own thing uh, without waiting for anyone? Thank you. Uh, okay, let me take two sets of questions, then I can answer them. Morning, everyone. Uh, I just wanted, I don't know, I came late, I don't know if you talked about it. I just wanted to know how can the community participate in IKS system, uh, IKS uh, center, the community, how do they participate? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll start with, with, with your question. Uh, we we are working in conjunction with a lot of communities as the IK Center. We, they are not only um, our research sites, like other people already say they are research subjects, but they're actually stakeholders within the IK Center. And everything that we do, we do with them. Um, it's, it's quite a strenuous pro process to work with communities. Uh, I've been sitting in that office for what, six months now, but already I'm exhausted. You know, you can imagine the committee engagement is, is a very demanding um, office and then Nalo Khotazo we hardly sleep. So we work with all the communities. We do not only focus with or we do not only focus on communities based here in Mafiking, just because we are focused here in, we are based in Mafiking, but we work with all the other communities. That's why we have people from Eastern Cape calling to the center and we still go to them. We have people from I know Makapan started they, they send a request 
and it's still to be, uh, I'm waiting for the green light from the, from the director if we have some funds to go back there because they want to learn more about this act and they want us to gazette their biocultural community protocol. And that requires a lot of funds. So we, we are still looking into that. So you can imagine if people from Makapan start, people from a, 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 a Monty, you know, Monty is, is, is in East, East London. We work with people as far as East London. We, we've been to Vupertal, you know, the, the Koi and the Sen community in Vupertal, Western Cape, and the other communities. So they are stakeholders here at the IKEA Center. We are not an individual entity and we do not treat ourselves as such. Because we say indigenous knowledge is community based, you know, so we are focusing on the innovations that come from the communities. And what we do, we just valorize them. We add value. We do not, we do not validate. Uh, at IKEA, we do not validate. Uh, people who validate are the ones who are going to the labs there. Our labs are in the communities. And then, Mr. Mashiro, the issue of land. <laughs> I had a similar question. Eastern Cape, um, we, we have what we call interministerial committees, you know, from the departments, various departments, science and innovation, uh, minerals and energy. And they sit together because some of the issues overlap from one uh, department to the other. And when we try to explain to the people or to the community is that the, the law, not us, the law says that you own, you own the topsoil and a meter beneath the topsoil. Anything after that meter belongs to South Africa, so it does not belong to you. You see, so that's the kind of, of, of um, problems we are sitting with because we are trying to address that. But for the communities who are um, mostly rural or indigenous communities who actually are still living under the uh, guidance of traditional authorities. Those are the ones that we want to dwell more into because they can now, they now have the right to determine them themselves. You know, the, the right to self-determination as we speak within the, the declaration of the, um, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and all that. So they are the ones who make the determination. But we have opened up an avenue to say that if a third party approaches you as a community, but this can only be done after they have done their PCP. If a third party approaches you as a community and wants to start a business, whether it's in mining or other uh, uh, identified uh, disciplines, like I said, that they are 18, if they want to do that, if they have the PCP, they can call us together with the DSI and we come and sit with them just so that we make sure that they are not robbed by the third parties, you know. Because sometimes when we, we hear 10%, we, we believe that that is a lot of money. And we look at how is the 10% going to benefit you as a community because you have to benefit collectively and no singular individual should be benefiting from any sort of activity happening within the community. So the issue of land is quite a tender one and then the, 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 the Department of Land Affairs is also trying to dwell into that and make sure that we start redistributing this land back to the rightful people and make sure that the activities happening within those lands can start beneficiating the real owners of the land. Thank you very much. Dr. Mateo has, has a, a question or a comment. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, we feel uh, there for the presentation. I think it's a, it's a very important presentation, but what I want to say is that I think this area of indigenous mining, uh, from the IKS Center, this is one of the um, focus area that uh, we are going to work with uh, going forward with the Department of Science and Innovation. And uh, we also have other stakeholders that we are going to bring on board, like Department of Mineral Resource and Energy. Uh, I know a couple of uh, months ago, I in attended the Mining Investment Conference in Rustenburg, where we heard all the, uh, the mining giants, uh, like your Anglo Platinum and uh, others, you know, we also, had to sell this idea of indigenous mining there. 
and it was very surprising to those delegation because for them uh, they never heard any concept about indigenous mining but uh, according to the history um, of Africa you realize that mining has always been there for a long time mining and metallurgy and what happened um, is that there's a lot of uh, stakeholders who start to get interest into now how can we start to promote this area of indigenous mining and we also want students who can also come to do more research around because mining uh, from where we look into in terms of the history of uh, mining in Africa we can trace it back to as far as Mapungubwe uh, you know that uh, in Mapungubwe we used to have um, evidence of how Africans used to do mining there and there's also other history in other parts of the continent of indigenous mining and metallurgy so these are not western uh, concepts but they are also there because in this mining issue we also want to focus on the knowledge and the technological knowledge which the communities used to have with regard to mining because mining for us is very broad like for instance it's not only about gold and chrome and um, all those other sophisticated minerals you can also mine salt because salt um, there are places where you can only find salt like if you go to namibia uh, there, are, there are rivers uh, which are just sitting there in the community and we all need salt all over the world and the supply of salt uh, is something that could also be looked into in terms of how can we now bring the technologies of mining uh, salt because those are May some of the resources not only about gold and stuff like that but also for your information is that uh, we are also working with the department of science and innovation we are going to host a very huge conference on indigenous mining in in november so uh, the plenary uh, is going ahead i think even uzile will be attending the plenary in uh, p3t i think on the fourth so you can see that we are serious about this there are resources that we also have galvanized for this conference. So um, we are not joking uh, with these issues, Cody, because this is a science week, and we thought we could also contribute our scientific and technological innovations and other creative ideas that we have uh, around um, the whole concept of understanding what is actually science, and when we're talking of technology, because at the end of the day, we want to interface uh, all these areas um, and what is crucial also here uh, Mashiro I think he spoke about those issues of beneficiation in terms of mining uh, because um, the local communities also need to be able to partake in these activities of mining so that we can be able to share the benefits that are arising so I think this is a very important concept that we are running with thank you very much Uzile for the brilliant uh, presentation Thank you, Dr. Mteo. Yeah, uh, as you mentioned, I was telling us rather that I'm exhausted because I have to go to Peter Tiff tomorrow morning for that plenary. So uh, we are going to meet again with the communities tomorrow. Thank you very much. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the attendees. Thank you very much for making time to attend this webinar. I would also like to thank Uzile Madize from IKS to do this presentation. I think we have learned a lot about indigenous mining. So really it was a good platform because during National Science Week we tried to engage with everyone so that people they can learn what our scientists are doing and so that they can do informative decisions when they, when, I mean, uh, regarding their lives. So I think it's very important to have events like this. So we thank you very much. I would also like to thank the uh, Department of Science and Innovation and South African Agency for Science and Technology Advancement for sponsoring this webinar. And also thanking our university, Northwest University, for providing us with the resources and as you can see we have venues we have everything thank you very much so this brings us to the end of the webinar enjoy the rest of the day thank you
and the list goes on. Nowadays, the world is changing rapidly and the number of challenges in all spheres uh, of human activities is growing. And the question will be, um, which role does uh, 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 basic science play and what is it capable of giving to mankind and particularly the state of the country? Let's look at the current uh, challenge faced by South Africa. Um, electricity. So South Africa produces about 57,000 megawatts of the total domestic um, electric, uh, uh, electric generation and this is um, actually uh, insufficient generation of electricity. So it produces about around 47,000 uh, megawatts against the installed generation capacity of of um, the 52 megawatts operational failure, and you know this is uh, a too much for one uh, power plant, and this actually causes um, high budget in terms of maintenance, and also you know you need a lot of money to to actually uh, maintain this power station. Just yesterday. Um, the, the Minister of Energy Crisis Committee held a media briefing to outline the measures to ensure long-term energy in South Africa. They identified about six power plants um, that already exist that are going to be used to utilize um, the electricity. But from, from the briefing, they did not you know, specifically outline the details on how the plan is going to go about the, the timetable for production as well as you know the budget which is the most important thing the budget how much are they going to need to actually sustain this power station that they mentioned yesterday so um we here in in chemistry we're going to give you a brief um just a short term, actually, the short term goal on how you can uh, produce your own electricity, your own light, actually, not electricity, because we still, you know, foresee a lot of uh, load shading in the coming years or coming months, but um, we have to be ready for that. I'm going to hand over to my colleague to continue with the presentation. Thank you so much, Shelley. Um, as she has mentioned, uh, we have encountered so many accidents in our country due to lack of electricity, where people are using uh, candles, and this causes a lot of accidents, a lot of deaths. So now we have uh, incorporated how we can use uh, our own uh, citric acid food at home to produce our own light bulbs. So the main goal of this is um, of making lemon battery is turning chemical energy into electrical energy, creating enough electricity to power a small LED bulb. One may ask, well, what is LED bulb? LED is light emitting diode. This is the type of an electric electronic device that gives off light when it receives electric current. How will the lemon work as a battery? The citric acid in the lemon reacts with the zinc and loosens the electrons. The copper then pulls the electrons more, to, more strongly than the zinc, so the electrons will move towards the copper when the electrodes are connected by the wires. The moving electrons are called electric current, which is what lights up the bulb. The reaction typically occur, uh, occurs between two types of metals that are called electrodes. These are positive and negative electrodes and a liquid, of, um, a liquid or solid phase that is called an electrolyte. As you connect this um, battery, one may take note that electricity like to take part of the least resistant, which means that if there are multiple ways to go from one electrode to the other, electricity will take the path that, leads, that lets it flow more easily. The components that are present in the battery is the anode, which is negative or reducing electrode that releases electron to the external circuit. And we also have our cathode, which is the uh, positive or oxidizing electrode that acquires 
electrons from the external circuit. We also have an electrolyte, which is the medium that provides the ion transport mechanism between the cathode and the anode of the cell. Electrolytes are often thought as liquids such as water or other solvents. So the construction of our battery uh, is composed of such. We have our two lemons. In this case, you can have two lemons or you can have four, depending how much you want to produce the light and then also how you want to connect your, your series. So uh, you can have a copper wire as well. You can have zinc stripes. You can, in this case, you can use nails when you are at home. You need a knife. You also need a two copper stripes that you can use also coins if you don't have the copper stripes. You also need the black and red alligator clips and you need the LED bulb. Uh, maybe the one with two volts or less. And then you also need the wire cutters and you also need the multimeter to measure your voltage. Uh, with this, uh, the construction will be you put in your your copper and your zinc, and then you connect them to your copper wire, and then your zinc will be your, your zinc will be your black clip, which is the negative, your anode, and then you have your copper plate, which is your positive, and a cathode, and then you put your, your alligator clips, and then you connect them, your alligator clips, the cathode side will go on the cathode side of your light bulb, and the anode will go on the anode side of your light bulb, and then that will react and then it will give us the light. So with this presentation, we're just trying to demonstrate how we can produce our own light bulb at home with uh, the food or essentials that we have at home in to de decrease the accidents that we have and that we foresee in our country due to um, people using candles like I have mentioned because not everyone can afford solar lights and not everyone can afford the solar lamps or the rechargeable lamps. So this is the easiest way that one can produce their own light at home. This is the main purpose of our presentation. Thank you so much. I don't know if we have any questions. Do we have any questions from the floor? And YouTube, do we have any questions? In absence of question, we thank you very much for watching and listening. Thank you so much.